Hey, man, I like that story. Obviously, uh, we used it a lot in reference to what must I do to be saved. You know, you would think that if anybody wants to know what they need to do to be saved, they would go to that place in the Bible where a man asked, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was simple, isn't it? <laughs> Believe on the Lord and thou shalt be saved. And thy house. That's the part. Uh, we went through all that just so I could bring that one point out. And thy house. <laughs> okay. And we'll make reference to that here in a little bit. But I want to finish up this uh, kind of like little mini series on ministering to children. A while back we talked about ministering to the elderly. And uh, so I thought it fitting that we would go into ministering to children. Talk about that for a little bit. And so I didn't want to close this without talking about preaching the gospel to children. So that's mainly what we'll uh, focus on tonight. Preaching the gospel to children. Just out of curiosity, we got a bunch of soul winners in here. How many have ever preached the gospel and led somebody to the Lord? Got somebody saved who, was, who you would consider a child, younger than teenage uh, years or whatever. And so, uh, quite honestly, in uh, just growing up in the what we would call the old IFB, right? The IFB, uh, you know, for many generations before us. Uh, growing up in that generation, a lot of young people were saved through that ministry. If we go knocking on doors in Iola, you know, we find somebody that's saved. It's very possible somebody say, oh, yeah, I got saved when I went to v VBS or something at your church or another church that preaches the gospel. A lot of people got saved when they were kids. And, uh, and, and in fact, the percentage, I don't know the statistics on this, but if you asked the average person in an independent Baptist church, now things are changing now. Uh, there's kind of a new generation of people that are, would call themselves IFB who maybe didn't grow up in it. But if you grew up in it and you ask the majority of people in a, in a regular congregation how many were saved before, you know, 20 the majority of people would raise their hand because they were saved as kids. They were saved in a youth program or something like that. And actually, uh, my testimony is, many of you guys probably already know this, my testimony, I was saved because a friend of mine when I was a young kid invited me to an Awanas program. And I just wanted to go have fun with all my friends. Eight years old, you know, nothing better to do on a Friday night. Let's go have some fun. We ran around circles and we passed batons and we played all the little uh, uh, games with bean bags and all that. You're familiar with the Samoana uh, games. Had a lot of fun and right after that they said, all right, now it's time to do Bible study. And I knew I was at a church activity so it wasn't a surprise. And I remember the, uh, the, uh, the uh, youth worker there, you know, in our little group, knew I was a newcomer so he said, hey, you know, uh, are, are, have you ever been saved? You know you're going to heaven if you die. I mean, it was real simple, just straightforward. And I'm like, no, I want to be saved. <laughs> I mean, it was so simple. And he took me through the gospel, just kind of ABC. I mean, it was so simple, right? But I knew 100%. I received that gospel, prayed, asked Jesus to save me. And I, had no, I really have not struggled in my life with doubts like some people have because I knew it was just a simple gospel. And I received that. And the story goes on that I went back home sometime around around that time and I don't know how influential this was with my family getting saved but I went back home and I said to my dad I, I remember uh, I, I kind of remember having this conversation I don't know I've heard him tell the tell the story but I came and said dad I got saved that means I'm going to heaven when I die have uh, do you know if you're going to heaven when you die now I didn't know what to do after that but I knew to ask the question right I had a concern that my parents got saved but I didn't know what to do and thankfully somebody who uh, somebody from that church, not the same person that led me to the Lord, but somebody from that church came back, followed up, and got my parents saved and my sister saved. I don't know how it all worked. I don't remember. I was only eight years old. I've only heard bits and pieces. I heard their testimony and tried to put it all together in my head. So because of that, I think the Lord, uh, as I grew up, began to uh, have a desire for ministry and felt the Lord calling me into the ministry, if you will. My uh, I did have a burden for young people, and I was involved in children's ministries. Uh, never, never did care too much to be in part of a youth group or a youth pastor, which is what I ended up becoming. But <laughs> children younger than that age, I had a heart for. I was like, man, we need to reach these kids while they're that age, so young, so impressionable, and so uh, just soak things up like a sponge and, uh, and receive the gospel so simple, childlike faith and all that stuff. And I had a, a heart for that. And so Lord saw fit to put me into that. I, I, I had my sights 
focused on being a missionary at that time, but the Lord uh, allowed me for many years to be part of youth programs and then end up being a youth pastor, not just with the teens, but also with the, uh, the younger, younger uh, children there. So for about 10 years, maybe a little less than that, in, uh, in Oklahoma City, and then about nine years here, something along those lines, I'm probably getting my ears up. That's a long time to minister to young people and then having my, the kids of my own and all that. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight will come from just experience, my own personal experience. Hopefully you can relate to some of it or at least learn uh, uh, something from it. But I, I, growing up in different churches, uh, one thing that I saw a lot of churches had and where a lot of kids came to be saved was through Sunday school program and the bus ministry. All right. Oh, your first blank, by the way, was children and young adults are usually the most receptive to the gospel. Uh, and that's very true. I mean, all the way up, you know, to maybe about 20. And then it gets a little harder, you know, to uh, present the gospel to somebody. Uh, but very receptive whenever people are young. And that makes sense, you know. Uh, they're very trusting of you. But in the bus ministry and the Sunday school program, so this is where a lot of the independent Baptist churches, I mean, they thrived at this. Back in the uh, late 1800s, uh, all the way up to maybe the 50s, 1950s, uh, this was just huge. And you go to independent Baptist church, they had the largest Sunday school classes. And, and you don't find this very much in just, if you just start reading church history books, They'll leave this part out, but it's true. Independent fundamental Baptist uh, churches had the hugest Sunday, the biggest Sunday school classes compared to Methodist and uh, uh, Presbyterian and all that kind of stuff. And so this has become uh, sort of an independent Baptist thing. Now, independent Baptist, I want to remind you, is not a denomination, right? We fall into that a lot and we think, well, what, is, what do the independent fundamental Baptists do? And we'll go to like the Jack Hiles manual, see how did he do it? Well, he was big on Sunday school. He divided everything into different classes. You got the adult class, you got the senior saints, you got the, I don't know what he called them, but you got all these, and he broke them down to all these different classes, the youth department and all this. And he was really big on the bus ministry. So that's where a lot of people picked up on this stuff. And to this day, even churches, independent Baptist churches that don't really care a whole lot for Jack Hiles, still use the same program <laughs> that he uh, instituted uh, years ago. But they had a desire and a love for the bus ministry. And I'm telling you, after working in the bus ministry for a long time, I understand that. I, had, I, I got that same zeal, right? I got that same desire to, uh, to reach these kids. And a lot of times we'd go into the inner city. Uh, and here's the thing. Most of their parents didn't really care what, the, hey, you're going to take my kids for a few hours and get them out of the house so I have some time alone? Well, go ahead and do it. And we would say, okay. Uh, vacation Bible school, we would literally go to daycares and we'd knock on the door and say, hey, we're getting ready to have a vacation Bible school. Some of them were already familiar with it because we did it every year. But those who weren't, we would say, here's the deal I want to offer you. We will take your kids, load them up on the bus, and take them to vacation Bible school every day this week from early in the morning till afternoon and we have a vacation Bible school and they would say all right give us some uh, waivers we'll have the parents sign the waivers and you can do it and we would go to these daycares load up the buses take them to our church and all the daycare workers would just sit back and relax for that week <laughs> right? so they loved it and we loved it because we got to take the kids we got to give them the gospel and a lot of kids got saved during vacation Bible school all right now, I know my philosophies change quite a bit, and, uh, and I'm not really big on that whole concept of, hey, send your kids and we'll tell them what to believe and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but as I go into this lesson, hey, if they get saved, if we have the opportunity to preach the gospel to them, we're going to do that, okay? So we had uh, the Sunday school, bus ministries, we had vacation Bible school. Vacation Bible school is always... Uh, a fun time and here's what we would do we would every time we would play all these games and at the very end we would give a lesson that children could understand and it would be you know typically geared toward at least two of the nights would be geared towards salvation and we would try to build it up where we would get the kids to understand these things and then we would try to have you know hey let's all these workers would come up and, and say hey if you want to be saved 
you know, just go see these workers. And, and it was just kind of like every year we would just look forward to that. All these kids are going to go and they're all going to get saved. And I know a lot of people would say, they didn't really get saved. They just kind of followed you into another room, listened to you preach the gospel. And hey, I can't say that. I, I know that that's probably true for some of them. But I know we did go through little checks and balances, you know, to make sure they weren't there just because their friends went there or, or whatever. But a lot of kids did get saved. And then uh, another big thing in the independent Baptist churches was the uh, youth meetings. You know, you'd have maybe a Friday night uh, activities where the kids would go like youth group. And they would uh, uh, just have a lot of people would get saved in the youth group. They would only because it was kind of cool in this group. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But they would like become like these youth group junkies <laughs> or uh, groupies, you know, these youth group, you know, just, oh, we love our youth group and all that. And I remember we had all these, uh, even in Iola, when we had a big youth group going, we would have these uh, uh, little sayings, you know, or these songs that everybody in the group would do. But the thing about it was, you know, a lot of times it wasn't real. And that's what I'm going to get to uh, here in eventually as well. But, uh, but this was a thing, youth groups. You probably met a lot of folks uh, that got saved in a youth group, started going to church in youth group. Then we had once a year we'd do youth camps. You know, uh, get a bunch of kids there, get them away from technology, get them away from uh, bad influences, uh, hopefully. I mean, a lot of times there's bad influences at camp too. But uh, get them out there under the preaching and they would preach to these kids, man, you get up in the morning, you got to meet at the flagpole, you got preaching from the Bible. And then you'd go to devotions, and then after devotions, you got this combined meeting where everybody hears a, uh, a message. And then they have, after lunch, after bre uh, breakfast, then they would go, and they would do, I'm mixing the time schedule up a little bit, then they would go, and they would have a, uh, uh, pr the preacher, the guest preacher for the week. He would preach the first chapel service of the day. And then they would go and they'd have some games and some, do some uh, uh, different contest type things. And then, and then later on that night, you would have another uh, preaching, preaching service. And he'd preach hard to the kids. And then after that, uh, you know, they'd have some final activities. Uh, and then right before bed, a devotion time where their youth pastor or whatever, would so just preaching every day, just over and over and over. And a lot of kids would get saved or else they would you know, try to clean up their lives and stuff like that. Maybe they're already saved, but they, you know, it's been a long time since last year whenever they got gung-ho for Jesus, and now they got to they gotta re, uh, uh, repent, you know, and <laughs> turn back to Jesus. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, so that was a big thing. And then youth rallies, you know, every, try to about once a month have a youth rally, take them to, and all these young, these are the ways that churches typically would minister to the young people and a lot of teen, a lot of young people have got saved i'm not questioning that but obviously we know my philosophy's changed a little bit on that and here's an interesting thing we were when i became the pastor i was still trying to hold on to these children's ministries because i love children's ministries and i love children i love to see children get saved amen uh, i have a heart for them because a lot of times their parents could care less but they will hear the gospel and they'll get saved and so i, I love that concept so I was trying to hold on to that, but it's like the Lord, after I became the pastor, kept saying, look, I'm done with you in that ministry. I'm done with you. For, you know, I've changed your philosophy. And he started taking all the, all the young kids and teenagers out of our department, I mean, out of our church for different reasons. And, and we tried to throw a vacation Bible school, man. I went all out. We covered that back, uh, that back wall. I built, my whole family worked, I mean, night and day for, for a couple weeks just, and we made, out of cardboard, we made this real detailed arc. I drew all the, the wooden slats and all this and this big arc in the back, and, and, and it was a place where they could do puppets. The kids worked on all these puppet skits, and they got really good at the voices, and, and, and they went over to skits all the time. They had it all planned out. Miss Valerie would play on the piano, and they would sing songs, and they would sing in harmony and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, the kids are going to love this. And we did all these things. I made some coloring pages that they could take home every day. They could do the coloring pages. We, had, we bought all these things for prizes. And if you do this, if you bring a friend, if you memorize your scripture, all this kind of stuff. And every day, I'm like, this is going to be great. Even in Iola, we've had times where we had like 100 kids come out to Vacation Bible School. And this last, uh, after I became the pastor, we tried this again, right? Because we had had results in the past, but we stopped having it for a couple years. And like five kids came the first night. 
And we kept trying to build up, and it got a little bit more. I think maybe one day we might have had 10. I don't know what the top was, but it was just kind of discouraging. We had more workers than we had kids. And then that Sunday, it was all supposed to lead up to that Sunday. Hey, bring your parents. Get them to come here, and I'm going to preach the gospel and try to get them saved and, and all this. And, and uh, Sunday came along, no kids, no parents. I'm calling the, calling the families, you know, hey, I thought you guys were going to come. What, hey, can you come pick us up? My mom and dad don't want to come. And so I drove over there and picked them up and brought them here. And I'm like, this whole week that we've invested in for these kids, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord, you know, if, if some of them got saved uh, and all that. But it's like I realized in my heart, okay, God's done with me in this area. Now, is Vacation Bible School bad? I don't think so. If kids are getting saved, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support somebody who's, who's getting kids saved, right? Uh, now, I realize the dangers of it and all that, uh, but, you know, I don't think that everybody that has a vacation Bible school is wrong. I would still like to do it again, actually. Uh, is bus ministry wrong? I'm not going to say that it is. I know there's dangers involved, and I, I'm not pushing that direction anymore. Uh, but, but, you know, what about church camps? We still planned on going this year, but they, uh, they, they changed it. What about youth rallies? I plan on doing one in November. I don't have a whole lot of teens, but we're still going to do a, a youth rally and get the, the news out there, and hopefully uh, kids will come that Friday night in November. What am I saying? I'm saying it is important that this demographic, if you will, get saved, you know, they're very impressionable when they're young. They need to hear a clear gospel. But who should be the ones preaching the gospel to the kids? Their parents. <laughs> Their parents should be preaching the gospel to them, okay? So in these types of programs, some young people are just looking for a crowd with which they can fit in. If you get a cool kid to come to your youth department, man, you got it set. All the other, if you get the football players to come, now, you know, all the girls are going to come because the football players are there and all the other people in the church that are looking for a crowd to join, man, they'll come. I mean, that's really kind of how youth groups work. You got to get the popular kids in or else the kids aren't going to come. I remember one time preaching uh, about how Jesus said, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's given the parable of the feast and nobody wanted to come. And I'm preaching this to the, to the teens that were there in, in my Sunday school class. And uh, I was talking about how Jesus said, uh, you know, they all had these excuses of why they couldn't come, you know. And then Jesus is like, I'm going after the maim and the, the halt and all this. And I'm saying, you know, this is how I feel as a youth pastor. I'm like, I'm tired of trying to get the popular person in here. And then they just leave, you know, because they got all these activities to do outside. They got to keep up their social status. And I'm tired of getting all the, you know, and I'm just going down the list. And I'm said, and I said, no, I'm tired. I'm going to stop going after the, the pretty girls. And I'm going to go after the ugly girls. And I'm pointing to these girls that are sitting right there in the youth department. I'm like, no, no, no. I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> But it's kind of true. It's like you go after them and you're like, yeah, we got the cool kids here. And then they're like, oh, I'm too cool for Sunday school. And then all of a sudden they're gone. Right. And it's just this up and down. You're just playing these games and you're trying to cater to the kids and do what you can do to make them happy. Man, it's, you know, if kids get saved, I'm glad for it. I'm thankful for it. I don't regret any time that the Lord used us in children's ministry. But sometimes, let's be honest, they're just trying to fit in or they're just looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Now, is that necessarily a bad reason to go to church? No, nope. <laughs> I'll take it, right? My sister, I remember growing up, uh, after my parents got saved, my dad started working on the bus route, and my dad started working in the youth ministry and stuff like that. And, uh, and I remember my sister, as she got to their teen years, 16, 17, a lot of boys came to church because they wanted to uh, meet my sister. And she'd say, well, you got to go to church with me first. Got to meet my parents first. And they start coming. Some of them got saved as a result of that. <laughs> Brother uh, A.F. Collins, not, uh, my, my wife's grandpa, uh, you know, when he first wanted to start dating Mrs. Collins, she said, well, you got to go to church with me first. Went to church and got saved. <laughs> and, now, and then later on, he became a preacher. So, hey, I'm not against it. Whatever their motivation is, if they go to church, I'm not going to, uh, to knock it. But sometimes, if that's the motivation, sometimes it pays off. But sometimes you just watch as the youth group is just destroyed. And here's what happens. And this is the big danger. I have to remind myself because I'm like, yeah, I love it. Let's get them to come. Let's throw a big party, you know, and do whatever it takes to get these kids in here. Then we can preach the gospel to them. They can get saved. It sounds really good. But here's what I found with the big danger with youth rallies. And I see it all the time. I see it with the camp kids. I see it with the youth rally kids. You bring in some kids that are unchurched 
and they don't, are very worldly. Uh, they, or their parents don't teach them the Bible. Uh, or even sometimes their parents do teach them the Bible, but they're just real rebellious or whatever. And then you get them with a whole pool of kids. And what happens is the bad apples, you know, <laughs> they spoil the whole bunch. And, uh, and those bad kids rub off on those good kids. And I'm not, I'm not kidding you, it happens all the time. Those kids get rebellious as soon as they become teenagers. They're still hanging out with these kids that they became good friends with at camp and all that stuff. And they go off and they live a, a very unrighteous life. Now, if they got saved, praise the Lord. But some of them, you know, like I said, some of them, they just came. It was a show. Uh, they were just trying to fit in or whatever. And they truly didn't get saved. We don't know. But many teens will forsake church altogether nine times out of ten. That's going to be the case. Unless, I mean, I'm making that statistic up, but let's, let's, that's just what I've observed. I mean, hardly ever is somebody going to stick with it unless their parents are making them go, their parents are teaching them at home, or they've got some godly influence in their life that will go get them out of bed, make them go to church, and all that kind of stuff. Most of the times they're not going to stick with church. They're going to leave. So it makes me think about 1 John 2. Let's go there real quick. 1 John 2. Man, this, um, if this message gets a little long, I will probably just, uh, I, don't, I want to turn it into two parts. I think I'll just fly through it. 1 John. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 19 says, they went out from us. Now, I'm not giving the context. Now, I'll just let you in on a secret. I'm planning on going through First and Second John in this, you know, on Sunday mornings here at this work. And so uh, I think that's some really good books for us to go through. Uh, so I'm not going to give the context, but it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been out, uh, if they had been with, I'm sorry, <laughs> if they would have been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And I'm thinking as a youth pastor, man, that's just what I constantly saw. It's like that person was, they weren't here for the right reasons. They weren't here for the right reasons. They weren't here. I'm not saying that it means that they, they didn't get saved if they didn't stay with us. But I'm just saying that it revealed to me that even though it sounds so beautiful, you know, to reach the young people this way, uh, so many times it was just just dead end roads and sometimes led to disaster. I found out couples within the youth group uh, were doing things, you know, that married people should do whenever they left the youth group uh, or even while they were still meeting, they'd go to each other's houses and stuff like that. Had no clue. Found out uh, young girls were getting pregnant right before they, uh, uh, I mean, while they were in like in their teens. Uh, they were getting pregnant. I mean, in every, almost every youth group I talk to, these kinds of things happen. They hear these stories all the time. Uh, several girls came through our youth group. You say, man, what were you preaching? I'm telling you, I was preaching hard to the fact that some kids of this day will say I'm, I was a cult leader and I taught all these crazy things. When they were there, they, were, they seemed pretty cool. But then as soon as they left, they're like, oh, you, he said if you don't wear, if a girl wears pants, she's going to hell. I mean, it's just kind of crazy accusations you get. <laughs> We had girls that came through the youth group who wanted to be boys <laughs> later on. You know, they left the youth group. Next thing you know, uh, they're arguing with me on Facebook saying, well, I don't understand why you're against homosexuality and you're against this and that. And, and, uh, and uh, just over and over, just the heartbreak. Now, if we're getting people saved, I understand it's worth the heartbreak. It's worth sacrificing yourself and putting yourself through that if they're getting saved. But it just didn't seem like it was working. You know, in an ideal world, what you'll do is you'll reach the parents and you'll get, teach the parents, you know, uh, how to be saved. And then the parents will teach the kids. Right. And then make them go to church and all that. That's not what we are seeing. We are seeing, uh, in fact, any kid that did seem like they were stepping up and they're they were growing in the, in the Lord. A lot of times their parents would all of a sudden they became their enemy and they just like shot it down and they just drove them away from church because it was so uh, they became their enemy at home and they just couldn't handle it. I'm telling you, man, it's it's a, it's a difficult thing to minister to children, but but a lot of children will get saved through the gospel. We can only hope that they didn't believe in vain. First Corinthians 15 two. This is what Paul was. He was talking to adults, but. He was talking about people that all of a sudden they were teaching a false gospel. And he said, whoa, I thought you, 
I thought you had it right. I thought you were saved. And so he's saying, uh, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I uh, preached unto you, which also ye have received, and whereby ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And so he's watching all these people that he got sa he, he, he led to the Lord, and they got saved, he thought, and now they're, he's not so sure anymore. You know, one of the follow-up visits we knocked on today, uh, uh, we went there, and uh, there's a whole lot of uh, maybe details as far as what was going on when I knocked on the door. Uh, but he's like, I'm really not interested. And I'm like, hey, I'm just with Isle Baptist Temple. Somebody came out a while back and talked to you. And, and, uh, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I remember. And he described, you know, uh, uh, what happened and all. But he is, I was like, well, I'm just trying to follow up, make sure you got a packet. Yeah, I got it. I got it. And so I just want to see if you had any questions. He's like, no, I'm not interested. And I'm like, in my heart, I'm thinking, did he even really get saved? I mean, how do we know? <laughs> how do we know? You want to see somebody that once they get saved and all of a sudden they're at least, you know, wanting to tell people about it. They're at least wanting to do something for the Lord. I realize that doesn't always happen, but it's such a heartbreaking thing. You start thinking, man, did you, did you believe in vain? Did you not really believe it? Did you not? Were you just giving lip service, you know? Children and young adults, here's what they need. And everybody really, but uh, children, young adults, they need influential people in their lives who are going to be serious and straightforward with them when it comes to preaching the gospel. Serious and straightforward. Another word for serious in the Bible is sober. Sober-minded, right? Not just always joking around and, and having the party at, uh, uh, feeling and, and wanting to play games and all that stuff, but they know when it's time to be serious. And they know when to look somebody in the eyes and say, here is what the Bible says. And if you don't accept this, you're going to die and go to hell. You know, Or... Even the next thing here, it says they need someone uh, who preach holy living to the believers, right? Hey, now you're saved, right? You, you said you believe that. You said you understood. It. Why are you living like this? You know, why would you do that? Don't you love the Lord? I mean, you know, you say, man, you're judgmental. Hey, this is what people need. They need someone to get serious and look yeah. them in the face when it's time to do that and say, look, if you're going to follow Jesus, it's not fun and games, <laughs> you know. The only thing worse than a parent trying to act like a teen, doesn't that disgust you? Yeah. It disgusts me, man, when I see like these ladies just walking around and they're talking like the teen girls and acting like that, or worse yet, a man, you know, and he's got, a, and he's got skinny jeans and a man bun, and you're like, man, you're 50 years old. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Grow up, right? right. But you know what's worse than that? Here's your next blank. Is a minister trying to act like that? His job is to minister the word, minister righteousness, minister, you know, help people to do this. And he wants to act like a worldly teen. But this is what the majority of youth pastors, I'll say this, this is what the majority of pastors are looking for in a youth pastor. If I ever had to have another youth, if, if I ever had to have a youth pastor, right, that's not the guy I'm looking for. <laughs> The guy has got an earring in his ear, and he's got the skinny jeans, and he's got the T-shirt on, and he's like, hey, man, I'm hip. The kids are loving me. Yeah, not interested. <laughs> I want somebody who has some kids, has some experience, has some maturity, you know. He can look the kids in the eyes and say, hey, it's time to quit messing around. Amen. And he's not going to sit here encouraging them to mess around, you know. I hear stories all the time about youth pastors getting their kids into trouble because they... He encourages them to do things that they shouldn't do. And so uh, that's not what I'm looking for. And I certainly don't want a pastor. I was looking at somebody that recently talked to me about this. Uh, I mentioned him once before when we were talking about long hair. And I said there's a preacher with long hair, Todd uh, White, I think his name. Is that right? Todd, I think it's Todd White, with the long hair. And I was like, uh, somebody recently asked me about him. He said, have you ever listened to him? And I said, no, honestly, I haven't. You know, I took one look at him and said, no. <laughs> but I was like, well, let me go ahead and check him out since this guy asked about it. And I checked him out. And man, he's walking down the, the like a mall or something, I don't know, and he's just trying to talk to people. Like, I'm gonna minister, I'm gonna give you a blessing, man, and that kind of an idea. Like putting I'm gonna put my hand on your head and just say a nice word, like, God, Jesus loves you, you know. Man, he's on fire. You see that? He loves Jesus. Come on, man. You could and, and I was like, the guy acts I mean, I don't know how old he is, maybe fifty. I don't know, he's probably not that old, is he? Maybe maybe somewhere between forty and fifty. And he acts like a teenager. 
<laughs> and I, that just disgusts me, man. I don't think that's what teens need. They need somebody who can say, the Word of God is a serious thing. Right. You know, The Word of God and living a holy life uh, is serious. Now, somebody will ask this. They'll say, well, what about 1 Corinthians 9, 22? 1 Corinthians 9, 22. I hear these people uh, using this verse. Where Paul says, to the weak became I as weak. You know, he goes through this list of uh, all these different, uh, you know, I became like a Jew, I became like whatever. To the weak I became weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some, you know. <laughs> I got to become like them in order to save them. You know, so if I'm going to reach those people in the bar, you know, I got to go into the bar. I got to go ahead and have a couple drinks. I'm, I've heard people talk like that. I've got to be like them to reach them. So somebody, instead of saying, you know, what can I do to reach a teenage boy, you know, who's struggling, maybe doesn't have good parents at home. I mean, I'm talking about when I say good parents, those who teach them godly values and stuff like that. So what can I do to reach this kid? If my thinking is, I want to be like the young, rebellious, punk kids, right? And then he'll listen to me. Man, that's, that's not right thinking. That's not right thinking. You've got to be what that kid needs you to be, and you've got to say, hey, this is what the Bible says that you need. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm getting old, but that's, <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's right. And for the record, even whenever I was a youth pastor, uh, you know, I, I, I was the fuddy-duddy, you know, uncool, nerdy. <laughs> so don't think I tried to be like that <laughs> hipster youth. I uh, imagine I don't probably have to convince you of that. But <laughs> it says, uh, so what about Paul, man? He was all things to all people. Okay, let's look at what else Paul said. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. <laughs> there you go, Todd White. What does he say in uh, 1 Timothy 4? Let's look at 1 Timothy 4. Verse 12, he tells, he tells uh, Timothy, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He didn't say, you know, don't let any man despise thy youth. Be young. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. <laughs> you know, learn all the trends and the fads and all that kind of stuff. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you need to be an example of what a believer is supposed to be like. Now, a teenager can do that. I've seen teenagers that can, they know how to act like they're supposed to, like they're trying to grow up and they're trying to learn the Bible and be godly. A teen can do that, but it's not going to help whenever a youth pastor decides to be like a young teen and then they just kind of stay just stagnant. If, even if they keep going to church, they just keep going to a youth group, playing games, trying to have fun and be silly and act up. You think that's going to last? <laughs> when they become adults and they're like, oh, you can't be in the youth group anymore, what are they going to do? Well, I need to find a church that still acts like, a, like their youth, you know, <laughs> like their youths. I need to go to the, uh, that hip church down the street, you know, that has the rock bands and the smoke and all the lights and stuff like that. And, uh, and they have lots of fun. And, and, uh, and, and so that, that's what we're teaching them if we don't teach them to grow up and to be sober-minded. All right, so... Uh, how about the way, I won't go there, but in Acts 15 we see where, how, John, how uh, Paul felt about John Mark. Now, John Mark apparently ended up being a pretty, pretty good man, but, uh, but whenever he was traveling along with them and he couldn't hang, hang out, he couldn't stick it out. It seems like he just kind of quit. Maybe it was too rough on him. I don't know the exact details. And in Acts 15, Paul says, no, he's not going with us on the next journey. And Barnabas kind of fights him on that and all. But look, Paul may have said, I became all things to all people, but he didn't say we got to be like the punk kids to be able to reach the kids. All right? They actually need some more stability in their life. They got plenty of teachers and parents that are still trying to be like kids. They need somebody that's going to show them the Bible. Okay? But regardless of how we go about it from time to time, we will have an opportunity to reach young people. And here are some thoughts on that.
reaching young people. Number one, giving the gospel to your own children. This is obviously the best way, and if you reach a child, uh, you know, you should try to reach that parent first, if possible. In a Christian home, it should be unthinkable that a child would not at some point receive Christ. I'm not going to say it never happens. I'm sure it happens where good Christian families and one of the kids uh, just rejects the Lord and becomes reprobate or something. But shouldn't it be unthinkable that a child wouldn't at some point receive Christ? So we read in Acts 16, Brother Justin already read it and I mentioned it a little bit, but let's read that verse again, verse 31 and 32, Acts 16. Oh, I think it's, yours says 40. Sorry about that. That was a mistake. 31 and 32. And, they, and, and he said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now, now, people have tried to use that, as you probably know. They've tried to use that to say, look, if you get saved, then that means your family is just automatically in. Right? <laughs> Or some have even tried to use this for baptism. I don't know. They have to really stretch it, but they say, so this is why we baptize kids, because if you're a Christian, right, you just baptize that kid, and now he's saved too. The text goes on to talk about them all getting baptized. Well, no, the reason they all got baptized is because the parents said, hey, I received Jesus, and now I'm saved. You want to receive Jesus too, right? Yeah, I want to receive Jesus. And they received Jesus, and they got baptized, right? It wasn't that they just like, oh, I got saved now because my parents are saved. Not necessarily. It doesn't work that way. We can't get to heaven based on what our parents did for us. But it makes sense. It only if, you're, if you say, man, how did that kid, I mean, I, have you talked to some wicked people, unbelievers, and they said, oh, yeah, my dad was a Baptist pastor. And I think, what was he teaching these kids? <laughs> what was he te- how, how do you have a Baptist preacher of a father and not hear the gospel and not know how to be saved? But it's out there. It happens all the time. We knock on their doors all the time. And many of them have become atheists, or at least they claim to be. <clears throat> it should be unthinkable that that would happen, but obviously it does. When a parent is saved, here's all they got to do. They simply need to begin teaching the concept of salvation to their children. They should know how to do it. They just got saved. No easier person in the world to, 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 uh, to teach than a child. And they'll almost certainly receive it as well. When we lead a person to the Lord... We should emphasize the importance of the whole family receiving this message. Now, I know I've made mention of this several times, but uh, brother, I was so went with Brother Stevie early on in starting this work here, and I remember he got somebody saved, and he asked them, you know, actually I, I didn't, I wasn't there with them, but I heard the story, and he said, "Does anybody in your house, else in your house, uh, need to hear this?" And Sure enough, well, my kids are here; they need to know how to be saved, and he was able to lead them to the Lord. And I thought, how simple. I know he said he learned that from somebody else as well, but that, doesn't that make sense? I mean, why wouldn't we think about that? Because we're so focused on, man, i got to go to the next house, i got to go to the next house. And even if you have to go to the next house, and even if they can't talk anymore, or, or they're, they, they're, they have no family home or something like that, you know what would be a good idea for us to say, can I come back sometime? Like maybe next week I can come back and talk to the rest of your family or something? Because they hopefully want to tell their family that they got saved. But they probably don't know exactly what to say, and they feel kind of weird about it. I might not tell them right. I don't know where the verses are. They'd probably love for us to come back and share it with their family. If they truly believe believe that and got saved, why wouldn't they want us to tell their family? And so, uh, so we should probably try to work harder on that. You know, you got saved. Now, what about your kids? You don't want them to die and go to hell. <laughs> you know, let's get your kids saved. That's the way that it should work. If it isn't possible, I already said this, uh, make arrangements to uh, meet with them. Children should know that this is something that their parents have accepted and want them to uh, receive as well. All right, number two, giving the gospel to a child at church. This is particularly when somebody comes in through the youth ministries or uh, something like that. Uh, There are children whose parents leave it up to them what they choose to believe. Now, I say that, and I've heard parents say that. I've heard parents say, hey, I don't force my kids to go to church. I don't tell them what they have to believe. You know, I leave that up for them. And I think that's the stupidest thing a parent could say. (laughs) I mean, how far can you take that? (laughs) I just leave it up to them, you know. 
If they want to live on gummy bears and ice cream, I just let them eat whatever they want to eat. <laughs> if they want to walk across the street without looking both ways, hey, you know, I'm not going to force you. It's just re it's retarded to think that, okay? So, however, they say that, but here's what I found. It's really not true. They have a natural instinct within them that says, well, I don't want just anybody to just tell my kid whatever. But, here's, but they'll say, yeah, you can talk to my kid. I don't care. Yeah, you can take my kid to church. I don't care what, what you do. You know, hey, he's make his own decisions. But the moment, here's your next blank, the moment they feel that you are indoctrinating their children, which is exactly what we're doing, you said, I can teach your child and you're not going to force them what to believe. I'm going to teach them doctrine. I'm going to teach them what the Bible says. But once they get this, whoa, 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 they're indoctrinating my child. Now suddenly you become the enemy and they naturally are going to fight against you. I've seen it happen all the time. You know when it really happens is when you try to baptize a kid. It's like, whoa, 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 this is getting a little serious. <laughs> I don't care what you teach them about heaven and hell and all that kind of stuff, but you want to baptize my kid? I mean, that's a serious thing. And a lot of times they'll start fighting you on it. You start uh, getting a kid that comes home and says, you know what? We had this happen. We took the young girl to camp and she came back and she, told, she looked at her mom and she said, Mom, I don't think you should be dressing that way. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have told the kid to go home and say that to her mom, but she did. I don't think you should be dressing that way. That woman said, what are you teaching my kids? <laughs> Just what the Bible says. I mean, this was actually a member of the church, you know, but anyway. <clears throat> we are indoctrinating, but a lot of times if a parent uh, starts realizing you're teaching them something different than what they believe, they're going to stop you, you know, that parent needs to be the one who learns what's right. Then they can begin teaching their kids. That's the way God designed it. <clears throat> Still, if a parent allows their child to come to church without them, they need to hear the gospel. All right? Uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but if a child... Uh, well, let me just not get ahead of myself. <laughs> it's on number three, so we'll get there. All right, it is possible for a child to influence their family to turn to the Lord. I don't know, again, to what extent I had that impact. I've heard the testimony saying that I did have a, an influence on my parents uh, coming to the Lord. But it is possible in the same way that a wife can turn an unbelieving husband to the Lord. As we see in 1 Peter 3, let's go there. 1 Peter 3, and it mentions a little bit about the next point, which is talking about the servants and their masters. But let me just read what it says about... The women, 1 Peter 3, behold, no, let me see here, that's John. 1 Peter 3, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that's talking about the husbands, if they don't obey the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversations coupled with fear whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, the plating of the hair and the wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. He's saying what they really need to see is not how pretty you are, not how, how you know, flashy you can do, you know, they, they be that trophy wife that they can take out and show off and say, hey, look at her. I always thought that was disgusting. Like, why do you want people to look at your wife and be sexually attracted? <laughs> I mean, what, what are you, some kind of weirdo? <laughs> but that's what people would do, right? But he's saying, no, no, no. What the husband wants to see, and he doesn't even know it. He might not even be a believer. But what he really wants to see is a wife who adorns herself with the inward man, you know, the, the, the godly uh, uh, new creature that's inside her. And she's chaste, and she is uh, submissive to her husband. <gasps> that's right. That husband is going to be like, man, this is such a good woman I have. <laughs> right? I want to know more about this Bible study you keep going to. I want to go with you. <laughs> I want to hear about this word of God that changed your life. I want to see it too. And they can begin to see that and they can begin uh, to be won over. In the same way, a master uh, can be influenced by their servant. The servant can turn their unbelieving master to the Lord. 1 Timothy 6, uh, 1 through 2. So you go to work and you got an unbelieving boss. You can be like, man, I just hate that guy. Uh, you know, he's always cussing. He's always, uh, you know, being arrogant and bossing people around and all that. You know what? He's your boss. 
Just go be the Christian that you're supposed to, do, supposed to be. Do the things you're supposed to do. Let them see your good works and glorify God. Let them see your, uh, your submissive behavior and all that. And you could actually turn your boss around to the Lord. What did I say? 1 Timothy 6. Sorry, i got to quit talking. All right, 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 and 2. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. And then he talks about those who have believing masters. They that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because... They are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Okay, but right there, he's, so he's talking about the unbelieving masters, and he says, uh, he says, let the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. I mean, you know, you hear about this lifestyle evangelism, which should, should not be the only way that we evangelize. We understand that. But shouldn't people see your good works, and shouldn't that cause them to say, hey, I want to know more about this God? I want to know more about what it is that has changed your life and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with letting people see your godly uh, example, and it would. Uh, but you know, but whenever they see a Christian who is living an ungodly life, then all of a sudden that that makes them you know uh, uh, blaspheme the God and the doctrine uh, of God. Okay, so the same thing for a child. Now it's rare. It's really hard because here's what happens: a parent, their child going to our church. And the child gets saved, and the parent says, good, maybe they'll start obeying around here. I'm serious. <laughs> it happens all the time. Oh, he got saved. I had a guy, they came to our church, uh, they came to a special service where the kids were there as well. And the kid got, oh, the kid got baptized on that day. And their parents came along with them. And, I mean, a week went by, and the dad wasn't a real dad. It wasn't her biological dad, but uh, I don't even think they were married. But he, but he called me up and said, could I talk to you for a little while? I said, yeah, what seems to be the problem? He's like, he said her name, I won't say it. <laughs> he said, she's just really not obeying. Like, and he's like, I don't think she really got saved. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? Well, she just won't obey me. I'm like, dude, that's your responsibility. <laughs> you can't put that on God. That's your responsibility to train your kid. Yeah, but I thought she's supposed to be saved. Now, I, I wish that she would have just started obeying her parents and living right, and her parents would be like, man, what got into you? But that's, that's just not how it always works, okay? All right, number three, giving the gospel to the child during door-to-door -door soul winning. Now, I've talked to some of you. Some of you said, yeah, I've done that, knocked on the door. Maybe your kids are outside playing. Now, let me give you a couple, just a real couple, you know, I think everyone's on the same page on this, but... You see a kid that's out playing by the sidewalk or something like that, don't just start talking to him, <laughs> preaching the gospel to him or whatever. If I'm a parent and I look out the window and somebody's talking to my kid at the sidewalk, I'm going to be freaking out, okay? So just go to the door. A lot of times they'll, talk, they'll start talking to you and you'll be like, hey, how are you doing? You know, I'm going to go talk to your dad or something. And then they start telling you, oh, nobody's home. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right? They're just kids, right? They're just, they don't know any different. And so you're like, I'm going to go talk to them, all right? And you knock on the door and talk, try to talk to the parent, okay? Now, sometimes I'll say, hey, you go to, while they're walking up to the door, you go to church anywhere? You know, you kind of get some background from because kids will tell you anything. <laughs> hey, your mom and daddy been fighting? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They'll tell you anything. So, uh, so you, uh, you got to uh, be, use wisdom when you're out there. And you got to uh, uh, probably not just start giving the gospel to a kid that's there, but talk, try to find out if the parents are home. Now, at the same time, if the parents aren't home, <laughs> you know, use caution because there's neighbors too watching you saying, what's this creepy guy doing? Man, if you got an opportunity to preach the gospel, it'd be, you know, I'm not going to say don't ever take that, that opportunity. For, well, the first time I ever went soul winning uh, with any of you guys was with Brother Austin. And uh, actually, Brother... Uh, uh, I should say Ken was with us too. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, anyway, sorry. So, but we went out on a snowy day. You remember that day we were in that trailer park, and, uh, and they were on. They were on my soul winning team there, and we were knocking on doors. And I remember seeing Brother Austin do this, and I learned. I learned this from him as well, uh, because I probably would have just left. The kid came to the door and he said, "Hey, is your dad? Is your mom or dad home?" Dad came out. He said, "Hey, I'm not interested." Right. 
And while we were waiting on the dad to come, I think he was talking to the kid a little bit at the door. And, uh, and when the dad came out, hey, I'm not interested, I probably would have said, okay, have a good day and left. But he said, well, your son right here was, was talking to me a little bit and, and he you know, seemed interested. You mind if I tell him the gospel? You know, and so anything you can do, right, to be able to, uh, to talk to them, you know. Like I said, if you can get the parents saved, you're still going to want to try to reach that kid. Well, can I, can I share this with your kids, with your family? You know, there's, that's a good, uh, uh, good opportunity. But uh, we should try to reach the parents first. We should first try to read the, reach the parents. All right, B, there are occasions where the parent isn't interested, but they will allow you the opportunity to present the gospel to the child. Take it. Take it. Take the opportunity. Just don't get arrested or get a bad testimony because people think you're a weirdo. All right, C. Now remember the following when you give the gospel to a child. And that includes teens to some degree. Okay? Young people receive simple, straightforward thoughts. It's really the easiest to lead a child to the Lord. It's so simple because they understand. Just You don't have to beat around the bush and try to warm them up and use all these examples and illustrations and stuff like that. They just, under, hey, just get cut to the chase. Tell me what it is I need to know. When we really realize that, I think the most... When I really realized that is the one time we had in our patch club that we had afterwards, uh, there was something going on next door. We were kind of wrapping things up. It was around Christmas time, and, uh, and we had a little extra time to kill, and the kids always wanted to, to go back into the puppet room and to play with the puppets. And so we said, I'll tell you what, here's what we do. We got a little bit of time, and we'll, we had like two different groups or three different groups, and we said, uh, each of you guys, you got like five minutes to come up with a puppet skit. And then we'll let you present your puppet skit, you know. So you got to be quick. And these two kids came up there. They didn't have a religious home. Parents don't go to church, anything like that, uh, you know. But they had been coming to the church for a while and hearing the gospel presented to them. And we didn't even think at this time that they were saved, all right. And then they started doing the puppet show. And they went back there and started doing the puppet show. And the one kid was like, hey, uh, do you know that you're going to heaven? And the other kid was like, no, 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 I, I've been trying to be really good and, 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 and obey the commandments and stuff like that. And I was like, uh-oh, what are they about to teach? And the girl said, well, nobody's good is what the Bible says. And you can't go to heaven by, teach, by, by, by being good. You've got to accept Jesus Christ. And we're just like, <laughs> so simple. And the kids are just like cut right to the chase. I mean, hey, I need to know the facts. Give me the facts, right? Take advantage of that. Be simple. Tell them the facts. They don't need a whole lot of weird object lessons and stuff like that. Believe it or not, they can get it. Now, they might not understand every word you use. You've got to be careful, right? Uh, try, to, try to speak so simple, uh, you know, that they understand everything that you're saying, but they understand simple, uh, straightforward thoughts. <clears throat> also, be careful because young people take things very literal. They're simplistic in their thinking, so be clear and make sure they understand what you're saying. They, they take it very literal. And I always use the example about uh, kids that don't understand. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to use this terminology, but kids that don't understand, Jesus is in my heart, right? I've heard kids like they totally don't get that, <laughs> right? And so it, maybe, maybe it, there's another way you can explain it to them, right? But some kids, they, don't, they just don't get it. Like he's got a little bed in my heart. I guess he's like this big. I mean, you just got to be careful because you never know how literal they're going to take what you're saying. And uh, young people have a short attention span. Some adults do too. If you totally lost them, it's okay. This is important, okay? If you're, if you're at a door, I don't care if it's an adult or a kid, and you get the feeling like, hey, I've been here 10 minutes. It's going to take me another 20 minutes to get through this gospel. And they're looking at me like, oh, I've just, I, you lost me like a long time ago. It might be okay to walk away, <laughs> right? I know it's hard to say because you're like, no, that person has to pray. They got to pray a prayer now or else they're not saved. Look, if you can see they're glazed over, they're not getting it, you might say, hey, maybe I can come back another time or, hey, I'll pray for you. Maybe God will send somebody else back by and we'll give this person the gospel. But it's okay to say they're not getting it. I've seen people give the gospel to a kid at the door for like 20 minutes and the kid's just kind of like, you're like, they're not getting it. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know? Leave them inf some information. Say, hey, share this with your parents, and, uh, and, and then let's go, okay? I've fallen into it myself, so I'm not getting on to anybody in particular. All right, remember, here's what we're doing. We're scattering seed, and we're watering that seed. God is the one that gives the increase. It's okay to walk away from a house and not having led somebody in prayer. All right? Now, if you can do it, I'm not going to stop you from it. Amen. But it's okay to just plant the seed, give as much information as you can, and let God work on that person's heart. Try to follow up, making sure that the child's parents know. Okay, this is with the uh, child that gets saved. Follow up and try to make sure that parents, the parents know the decision. That, hey, look, we're not keeping secrets. It's not like, don't tell anybody you got saved, okay? Your parents will freak out. No, no. we want their parents to know, hey, they made a decision to call on the Lord to save them. Now the parents might freak out, but, you know, they ought to know. That was a good stepping stone, you know. I think it's even better to say, hey, you know, little Johnny, did you tell your mom and dad what you did the other day? What did I do? <laughs> That's what happens sometimes, too. Well, you tell them what you did. Well, didn't you, you know, accept Jesus and, and, uh, and, and you got saved? You're not going to go to hell anymore? And, I mean, you know, let that kid tell their parent. It's great, you know. It's, it's, great. it's, it's great on many levels, you know. But they should tell their parents, if at all possible. But you should definitely follow up when a child gets saved and try to get the parents on board as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you. For, for your word. Thank you for the ministry that you've called us to. And thank you, Lord, that we can uh, uh, see folks get saved. And what a great report to hear uh, so many saved just in this year. Over 100 people call on the Lord. Just, it just amazes us. And, and uh, we don't know who receives the gospel, who doesn't receive the gospel, but we just trust that these that called on you, uh, they meant it and they believed it in their heart and they truly got saved. We hope that others got saved that heard the gospel and maybe we didn't hear them pray, but maybe you continued working on their heart through the Holy Spirit and maybe somebody else came by and watered that seed. I don't know, Lord, but I pray you help us just be faithful, not worry too much uh, about uh, uh, just the minor details or, or uh, uh, maybe we would even get in the flesh and want people to see uh, how great of a work we did and how many more we led to the Lord than somebody else or some other church. and Help us not do that, Lord, but help us just truly have the motivation that we want souls to be saved, we want people to hear the gospel, and we want to uh, scatter that seed out there, Lord, that you might work on their hearts and people will get saved. <clears throat> Give us wisdom, Lord. Help teach us. Help us grow in knowledge of how to present your word and how to uh, uh, convince people of your word. And I pray you You'll bless us and guide us as we seek to do that. You'll be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.